All right. So welcome, Michael. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, author of three, four books. Is that correct? One is coming out uh, in like next year. So yeah, four books technically, but three that are available. Three are available. Okay, very good. Yeah. And yeah. you live in the West Coast of Canada. You live in Vancouver? I live in Victoria, actually, which is sort of on an island just off the coast of Vancouver. Yeah, so we did like a little thing about like where everybody's calling in from. So lots of okay. Canadians, actually, but um, Orlando, Florida, um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Ottawa, Toronto, Waterloo, Calgary, Saskatoon. Uh, Joe just met you, actually, at a workshop. <laughs> okay, great. In Saskatoon. Yeah, I was just in Saskatoon this weekend. Yeah, so she posted a photo of um, you and her on the uh, on our like group board. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, all right, so I have tons of questions, but um, I do open it up to the floor. If anybody wants to ask their question live, they're more than welcome. Um, and if you want to pop your question into the chat window, then please feel free and I'll make sure that it does get asked. Um, Greenwood was, um, so the way that Greenwood came to me, just out of interest to you is, um, one of my friends was at a bookstore in Barrie and the bookstore owner recommended it to her. And then she re read it. And then she said, Aaron, you have to read this. And she sent me a copy, which is absurd, but anyways. Um, and then I read it and I was like, Oh my goodness. Uh, she's like my, like, you know, you, one of those friends you have that you just trust everything they say about books. She's that person to me. <laughs> Amazing. So when I read it, I was like, Oh my goodness. And, the, and then my next thought was, Oh my goodness. It's too big to like, it's not going to win a vote because <laughs> it's too big. <laughs> so then I was like, okay, well, I'll just slip it in there in December then because I get to pick one book a year. So um, we were thrilled to slip it in there. Although everybody has said now that I should not choose December's because December's too busy. And <laughs> anyways, um, so I'm going to just kick it off. But uh, just for the members, if you do want to ask a question, please feel free to uh either put them in the chat or raise your hand. There's a raise your hand functionality and I'll make sure that they get asked. Um, so my first question for you is how long did it take you to write this mammoth book? <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Um, longer than it took to read. So yeah. Uh, but I just want to say thanks to you, Aaron, for picking it and for, uh, yeah, celebrating my work in that way. It really is greatly appreciated. Um, and I wrote it, you know, it, it is a longer book, but I hope that, you know, it, it's written in a way that is propulsive and a way that is engaging so that those 500 and whatever pages uh, go by uh, easily, hopefully. So uh, it took me four years to write um, another year of editing as well. And that was like full time work. It was like an enormous amount of research to write each time period was was pretty demanding and I kind of did this thing where I sort of did an like a method acting approach where you know during 1974 I read books written in the time I listened to the music I didn't like dress <laughs> in a 70s fashion but I certainly just kind of tried to steep my mind in that time and uh really got into, you know, each section that way. Uh, Cause it is a, it's a, it's a big book and it spans a lot of time and contains, you know, uh, lots of facts and places and details. So it, 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 it took a long time. Uh, Michael, do you have children? I do. Yeah. <laughs> Were they like, what's going on with daddy? <laughs> yeah. Well, like I had a, at the time we were living in uh, like uh, on Galliano Island, which is an even smaller island, uh, just off the coast of Vancouver. And I wrote the book mainly in like a 10 by 10 cabin. Uh, and so I put up like plot, you know, pictures and research material all over, you know, the inside of this cabin. And my friend came over and was like, it looks like you're tr either trying to catch a serial killer or you are a serial killer. And I'm wondering which one it is. Um, yeah, it was like a lot of, of work and just, you know, pretty, pretty all consuming for me during that time. Yeah. So my kids were for sure concerned. <laughs> um, the thought of like this little island off of Victoria Island, like obviously leads way to um, the story and where, where the, where the book starts off with uh, Jake and was like, was your, where you were, did that have a lot to do with sort of like how you came about this idea? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, this is an island that is full of 
gigantic, towering, beautiful trees, you know, Douglas fir and re Western red cedar. And uh, so I was, you know, walking in those trees every day and just being amazed by their presence. But also um, on the island, there are uh, many of the cedars are uh, dying. And these are trees that are, you know, over a hundred years old been used by indigenous cultures forever you know for various things and they're just gorgeous living things and a lot of them are browning and withering now uh because of repeated drought stress um and so the you know i'm often asked i was actually asked to go to like a sci-fi writing uh convention <laughs> and <laughs> And I kind of turned, I turned it down because I was like, this is not sci-fi. Unfortunately, this is the climate crisis. And this is, you know, I've used some imagination here, but I'm just carrying things forward a little bit in the direction that things are, seem to be going. And that is, you know, trees are, are suffering uh, because the climate is changing so drastically. So it's very much written from a place, uh, uh, from that place and that place I was living. I was actually reading it when I was on Bowen Island, just off of Okay, <laughs> perfect place, yeah. yeah. So I was, uh, we had a host retreat there and I was like in the perfect setting for it, <laughs> so. Yeah, and I mean, anywhere too. I mean, it's I've been fascinated, like it's been published all over the world now. And, you know, it's just, it's astonishing to see the way readers connect with the descriptions of forests and the tree mythology and the metaphor of the family. Um, you know, that's been really surprising for me to see not only folks who are on these forested islands in Canada, but just everybody all over just uh, there's a, there's this real deep connection between the human being and the tree. And that was what I was aiming for. Um, so, again, everybody, if you want to ask a question live, please feel free or just put it in the chat window. But um so you wrote um, Beggar's Garden and If I Fall, If I Die. Those are both very, very different books, um, but they also are award winners. Um, then Greenwood went on to win even more awards. I would like to know um, how does a writer continue on that sort of trajectory? Um, and if this is like a lot of like, there's so much pressure on you already. Like, does this just add to it? Yeah. Well, I mean, you just have to decide that you want to win awards and then just do it. No, just kidding. no, it's, uh, I mean, I've been very lucky and there you're right there. All three books are quite different though. I, you know, do recognize lots of, you know, commonality, uh, between them all. And, um, you know, I've really just kind of guided myself by my own interests and my own sense of what I'm interested in and, you know, hoping in the hopes that the reader will share that interest with me. My second book was very autobiographical. If I fall, if I die. Um, my mom growing up was agoraphobic and uh, didn't leave the house for years at a time. Um, and so I kind of fictionalized that relationship for that novel, uh, though drew upon my life to a great degree. And then after I finished that book, I was like, I am never doing that again. I'm not going to write about my life at all. And I wrote Greenwood and uh, have since realized that there's all kinds of um, uh, personal and emotionally charged stuff in there for me. So it's, it's, I think I just kind of go towards the places that interest me or feel like they're emotionally resonant for me and then yeah, and end up with the book that I end up with. Um, but I do try to ignore the pressure um, and yeah, and we're, turning Greenwood into a TV series like right now. And so uh, that's been an exciting process and I'm very much trying to just keep uh, grounded uh, during that as well, so. That's amazing. Um, and do you, mm -hmm. and like we've heard from lots of um, authors um, on that experience of whether it's a movie or a TV show, but um, do you have any say? Do you get to, is it just kind of all above you and they just, like <laughs> to see what you think or i mean so far i have to say it's been a great experience okay. thus far i'm working with 
a producer who's done incredible stuff in the past. Uh, and I am an executive producer on the project and I've been collaborating and contributing to, uh, you know, how things are evolving. And so far I'm just delighted with, with the direction that it's taking. It's going to be like a 10 episode Amazing. limited series. It's a big book and we've all seen good books turned into terrible featured films. So this, this new series format is just so wonderful in terms of just how much narrative you can contain and so so far uh so good oh that's so exciting yeah and to know that it gets to reach more more viewers right absolutely yeah it's it's great fun and i'm a big fan of you know good tv as well and certainly literary adaptations are being done better i think more and more uh so yeah, I'm just really excited to to see it on the screen, and you know, like casting, yeah, people is just such fun and has been really, really uh, just a wild experience. Yeah, oh, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. um, okay, the ladies would like to get into characters. So okay, um, Mandeep has a question. She said, "Which character first uh, came to mind? Which was the first one that was fully fleshed and perhaps at the center of your web?" <laughs> Yeah, that's a really great question, Mandy. Thank you. And I mean, I I began the book kind of writing about a number of characters. I know I'm kind of dodging the question, but <laughs> a number of characters who all I realized were kind of related to trees and forests. And it wasn't until a bit later in the process, I was like, oh, I think these people actually belong to the same family mm. uh, and that they're actually living in different times. Um, so then it was after that that the writing was almost this discovery of like, okay, how are these people related to each other? And what do they mean to one another? And what have they sacrificed uh, to forge this weird family that is kind of not a family, but also is a family? And that was really what I wanted to investigate uh, with writing the book. So um, who came first? Uh, Everett for sure came early. Uh, Jake uh greenwood actually did as well uh willow did um so yeah characters like those uh were kind of just just began as sort of like hazy ideas and then grew into the people who they are and i will say like i think you know everett is certainly kind of the beating heart of the book in so in many ways but i certainly and i am very very proud to have created him and i you know still think about him regularly um but many of the characters i think are you know i don't know they're they're all they all contain something that i that i'm proud of even the you know the sort of villain like characters like lomax or harris greenwood they all kind of have a humanity to them that i think um you know i'm i'm happy to have created um the two brothers dynamic did that come from anywhere specific or <laughs> We could get my older brother on this uh, call, and um, yeah, no, I, I, this is one that I uh, realized that later on that I, yeah, I do have an older brother um, who's like a business guy. Uh, he and I were very, very different growing up. Didn't really get along, and kind of found each other again later, and now are like as close as. Uh, brothers can be so um, yeah there was certainly a lot of that emotional resonance in that relationship and it was great fun to write just their you know their competition and their uh, fighting and their inside jokes and and also I will say too that uh, during the writing or prior to the writing and during the writing I uh, lost both of my parents um, to cancer and both of them and pretty quickly uh, and so uh, I think a lot of that experience and I had two kids as well during that time and so just, just like a lot of that experience of just being in the middle of that generation and seeing people leave and seeing people come into the world um, just really got me thinking about generations and intergenerational relationships and inheritance uh and uh all the stuff that the book engages with so it was you know a, a way of processing that i think as well for me oh wow a lot in four years <laughs> it was a busy time 
yeah not, don't well, really oh, yeah no. a lot was covid was, sure. what were you right you were done by covid i was done yeah the book came out in the u.s in uh 2020 which right. is a spring 2020 so great time for yeah a, exactly <laughs> for a book <laughs> well everybody mm -hmm. was home reading at least <laughs> that's true actually and i actually spoke to a number of like hollywood type movie people when we were doing the film to tv thing and they were like yeah normally i don't read books this long but oh, i funny. all my stuff got shut down so it kind of benefited the book i guess in a way um so my next question is about uh research but i want to know uh obviously there's a historical research that you did that that you didn't do for your other two books um, but there's also like post-apocalyptic type research. And I'd love to know sort of like how you did the research for the stuff that came before and then how you did the research for the stuff that unfortunately, hopefully is not coming, but is coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, I mean, there. that's very interesting that you pointed that out. And I think they're they're similar, but different in the sense that as a writer, you're you're trying to convince, right? And so you're looking for those details that will quickly paint the picture and feel authentic and make the reader feel like they are in fact there. And so for the 1908 section, I actually read a lot of memoirs written by folks living in Southern Ontario uh, in small towns at the time. And that was actually where I kind of got that voice from that we voice. Cause actually I, I, I be when I first wrote the middle 1908 section, I tried it in each of the young boys' perspectives and each one didn't work. And then I tried one particular person, like the woman who takes care of them. I tried her and then, but that felt too limited. And then at one point I just wrote we, uh, and was like, oh, this feels uh, like it's opening things up. And I realized that it was the town. Um, and this kind of like judgy, and in some ways kind of nasty uh, voice uh, uh, for the town that sort of told their story. And, you know, uh, yeah, that 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 part really opened up. And, and that voice came from reading all those sort of firsthand accounts. Um, elsewhere, I mean, in 1934, I had like uh, department store catalogs for the the exact year and I would kind of just flip through and find, you know, particular items that I found interesting, like babies, uh, clothing, um, at the time was not pink and blue. Everyone should know that there, that gender distinction was not yet invented, which was really nice to discover. Um, and you know, just that part is the great fun. The research piece is addictive and seductive. And I've seen other writers get lost there. And so I was really both like enamored with it, but then also careful to not overdo it and not just get lost in all those wonderful details that you can, you know, dig up forever. So, but the future section, I uh, wanted it to be kind of uncomfortably close to the present. So I didn't, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't going to invent a bunch of technology. I wasn't going to, uh, have drones flying around. You know, I really wanted it to be plausible uh, and almost just like a just a continuation of what is already happening. And you know, the the notion that these beautiful, pristine, natural places could become luxuries someday is not that far away. I mean, certainly as the climate changes, and particularly, you know, Canadians are aware of the fact that. You know, the U.S., particularly the, the southern U.S., is not going to fare really well during this process. And that, you know, Canada is kind of sitting on all this water and all these trees uh, and all this sort of habitable land. And, you know, that's something that certainly is, I think, part of the consciousness uh, up here. So I kind of wrote my way into that as well. Um, yeah. Shavika has a question, but before I ask that, I do want to just because where we are in this conversation, um, was it important for you or was it just fascinating for you? But was it important to include um, sort of where we're heading? Like, are you an environmentalist? Like, is that was that part of your sort of mandate in the book? Absolutely. I mean, I yeah, it's something I think about 
constantly is something I'm very active uh, in and just like my life as a normal citizen person. Um, I support a bunch, lots of causes. I, you know, engage politically to some degree, but I also knew that, how can I put this? You know, literary fiction or fiction in general uh, is not going to change someone's mind who is a denier of climate change or someone, you know, uh, but it it can deepen the emotions around the idea and it can uh, turn something that's that's very scientific and sort of almost you know difficult to comprehend because it's so bad into something emotional and visceral for a reader to experience and so I really hoped to not only give a reader that experience of what a treeless world maybe would feel like but then also uh, make some suggestions on how we got here uh, as well and and you know what we've done to the environment over particularly over the last 140 years is is a great crime. And so I, you know, wanted to dig into that as well with the book. Uh, that was one of the things I appreciated about it the most. Um, having yes. lived through my twenties and early thirties very naively, and then I had children and then it was like, hold on. <laughs> and when you have children, then the world becomes a very different place. Absolutely. Yeah. And just, you know, and seeing these changes take place now, you know, and seeing, you know, these great shifts that are happening and realizing how fragile our climate and ecosystems actually are. Uh, you're very right. And that, that consciousness elevated for me as well as the moment I had children too. Um, Shivika asks, can you tell us more about what led you to this idea in your book? And then she writes, um, one only needs to purchase the land on which such a thing is rooted before one is permitted to destroy it forever. And strangest of all, there exists no power to stop you. Oh, thanks for asking that question. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like, where do I start? Um, you know, the uh, what is I think you know, particularly as a Canadian, um, which is you know, Canada is very much a country that is founded and that has prospered off of the exploitation of not only people but not only indigenous people but the natural environment um you know mining fur trading and now oil timber uh the fish in the east coast and so you know there's this been this enormous wealth that has been amassed uh through the exploitation of, of these resources and i think that this idea <laughs> that you know, as the quote states that you can buy some land and all of a sudden you own a thousand year old tree and you can do with it whatever you want uh, is almost perverse or is perverse, I think. And um, I really do believe that we have to come towards, move towards a deeper conception of uh, ownership and, and our responsibilities uh, uh, with respect to the natural world. Um, and so, yeah, that, that was, I think, it, I think it's, it's Willow who has this sort of passing realization. Um, but, uh, that's certainly something that, that baffles me constantly, how, how we're allowed to pollute rivers and how, you know, we, how much we disrespect this perfect, wonderful ecosystem that has, allowed us to thrive for so long it's just it's just it's it's astonishing thank you and thank you for your question uh tree communication that was something that kind of resonated a lot with me and you got into it a little bit and i was reading an interview with you and it sounds like it's something that you're that you stumbled upon and found very interesting Super nerdy, another really nerdy tree subject for me. But yeah, no, there's a researcher at uh, UBC whose name is Dr. Suzanne Samard and who actually was a sort of model for one of Richard Powers' characters in his book, The Overstory. Um, and she was someone who did this pioneering research 
and was discredited for years and years by uh, the scientific community and her work was sort of dismissed as, you know, kind of woo woo uh, until people came around and have realized that trees do in fact, not only communicate with one another, uh, but also share resources, um, you know, donate when a tree dies, it, you know, donates its, uh, its, its nutrients and its chemical weapons to its community uh, to be absorbed, to be reabsorbed by uh, the trees that it's lived amongst for, for all those years. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's not only just completely fascinating <laughs> to me, but it also, I think it's indicative of the fact that the world is so much more complicated uh, than we give it credit for. And we find this again and again, and I'm sure there are hundreds of more of these ways that the world functions or the ecosystem functions uh, in these subtle, beautiful ways that we have yet to discover. And I think that's one of the great tragedies of you know, cutting down the Amazon rainforest or, you know, altering the climate is that we're never going to get to figure these things out uh, if we, if we uh, destroy these, these ecosystems. So yeah, it's uh, that, that part of the research was, was great fun. And I still do a lot of reading around um, tree related stuff, even though my new book doesn't really center on trees so much. Um, I do want to ask you about what you're working on next, but before I do that, um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to know that perhaps you've already answered this, but a uh, favorite character to write. Um, I know Everett is obviously close to your heart, but was there anybody else that stood out? There, I've done a lot of events uh, related to this book, and you know, I've I've really I've been fascinated by how much how divisive Willow. Greenwood is and Harris uh, and there are people and Lomax too and there are people who you know just detest Willow uh, <laughs> as well as as well as Lomax and I and I find that you know I feel like I've maybe done my job with those characters in the sense that they are complicated you know and Willow is a person who whose environmental ideology has kind of you know uh, superseded her. Uh, even duty to being a parent, which is something that is very, especially for me too. I mean, it's a hard one to swallow. Um, but at the same time, you know, I did, I, I interviewed folks who started Greenpeace and, you know, who were really involved in the, the burgeoning environmental movement. And a lot of the time people do do stuff like that when they're focused on a cause or when they're, you know, almost like a, a true believer. And so, you know, I, but I will say here, there's one more anecdote. I, when Harris Greenwood is interviewing people for the role of his describer, and I was writing that uh, scene, I didn't know who's going to walk in the door. Uh, and I it was one of those days where I just started going and I was like, who's this guy? And, you know, Harris is a person, uh, who it doesn't have sight. And so uh, I was kind of in his position, just sort of discovering this, this man uh, who came to be Liam Feeney. And so uh, I think the, the scenes where Liam is describing the world to Harris and the, just their relationship and the beauty of, of, of that, I, th those were all a very just sheer discovery for me. And that was maybe one of my favorite moments writing the book. Uh, sorry, that leads me to, to wonder, it's, it, it feels like you, they, they call them pantsers and plotters. Um, and I think our members know what that means, but <laughs> whether you plan out your book beforehand, or if you just, or you sit down and you write and it comes to you as you write, do you do both then? <laughs> I do do both. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of, I pants for a while, then I plot and then I fix and more that I just, I'm a fixer. I have like, I. I make a gigantic mess and then just try to make it all make sense is generally what I do. Maybe there should be a third, like a, <laughs> like a mess maker. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I, I find that I, I've tried to plot everything out and plan, uh, but it never goes accordingly. And then I've tried the other way to just totally wing it. 
and that doesn't work for me either. So I kind of, I flip between those two uh, modes. And do you write one time, like frame at a, at a time, or are you just going back and forth all the time? I was jumping around early, like when I didn't know where the characters were and I didn't have that like ring structure that the book eventually assumed. Uh, actually pretty early I had that like sense of, oh right, these are rings of narratives. We're going into the tree. I had that metaphor and that was, things got kinder <laughs> to me after I got that. Uh, but after that, I started to do that sort of more kind of uh, method acting thing where I was just in the time and actually had all the sections together because uh, there's two pieces of each, right? And I would write my way through it and then I would sort of find a place to chop them in half and then uh, oh, okay. and then put them into the narrative. So, yeah. So, yes, what are you working on now? <laughs> Uh, now I am uh, working on the Greenwood series, and uh, I'm also writing another TV series with a really great uh, author who's from the U.S. who I'm really, really excited about uh, to be working on something with, and we're doing that. Uh, and But then I also have a new novel that has uh, found a publisher, and we're just editing it. Uh, now and it's um, about a small island uh, off the coast of BC another one that I've invented actually and um, it's the story of a uh, people who go there to stay at an Airbnb and a young woman goes missing uh, and then it kind of dives into the history of the island and drags up uh, all these secrets uh, as everyone is kind of searching for her. Um, is this a is this a psychological thriller? It sounds like it, and actually, it kind of has this thriller structure, but it's very much character driven, and it's not your it's not the missing girl in the woods book that you're expecting. And I'm almost kind of like in the way that I sort of messed with the family saga formula yeah. with Greenwood. I'm kind of doing that for all those books there where the girl goes missing in the woods and everybody freaks out. Uh, it's, it's a sort of investigation and a reimagining of what that means and uh, the consequences of that. Uh, is it big or do you, perhaps you don't know yet? <laughs> it's smaller. No, it's, it's shorter. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, 300 I think I mean this is the editing process yeah. so who knows but uh yeah it's not as epic oh wow yeah. that sounds fascinating and um you kind of segued there and quite nicely in in that you said it's found a publisher is it being published by those who published Greenwood mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yep same folks okay so that was my next question and um it was yep. sort of brought to me by Joe because um, she's an aspiring writer and attended uh, a workshop with you. So I was just wondering what your advice for for would be writers or new writers um, is in in two two ways: those who are just literally sitting down to put something like pen to paper, but also those who have actually written something and now don't know what to do with it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I uh, I'm a writer. I'm a writer who kind of came to it later in life, and I. Uh, really do think that the first thing you need to do is identify the the writing that you love and you know as a it, really develop yourself as a reader and figure out what really really speaks to you um um and i'm certainly not a genre snob i think that can wherever <laughs> that is wherever you know whether it's literary fiction whether it's thrillers whether it's horror fiction you know there's all these categories now which i think is great uh you know, identify what it is that truly moves you um, and start to read and think about how things work, why they're structured the way they are. Why is this sentence here? And why is, you know, why does this come now, this detail? And once you start to sort of think as a writer, um, that can, that will really benefit you in your path uh, forward. Um, because a lot of the time writing, the question is not uh, what to write about, it's what to include. 
it's very easy to overwrite. It's very easy to come up with all kinds of text, but it's hard to come up with a story that actually works uh, on a narrative level. And so my advice is read, 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 uh, sh write, show your work to people who maybe hopefully know what they're talking about. Um, and uh, tr try to submit your work to smaller places like literary magazines to get it published first to just kind of build up that muscle uh, and then, you know, uh, send to publishers. It's easy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Once in a while you hear like a story where it was easy, but most of the time it's like 90% of the time it sounds impossible. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, that's the great thing about it, I think, is if you view it, you know, nothing worthwhile is easy, you know. Relationships, not easy, <laughs> but great. <laughs> so. uh, we have, uh, I have a very large family and at Christmas I bought them all copies of Greenwood and we're holding our first family book club <laughs> at the end of February. So um, I will get a lot of flack if they don't love it, but I'm not worried at all. <laughs> I'm not worried either. And what a great, it's about family, sharing it with your family. So that's, I'm super happy to hear that. Let yeah. me know how it goes. Well, all the feedback from all of the book clubs all over the world, we have 150 of them have been like so positive. Everybody loved your book. We did a vote. We did a year end vote with all 12 books and you didn't win, but I think it's only because not everybody had finished the book to vote in time. So you came in second, but I think you would have ah. won if we had have done it in Look. like January or February when people had time to finish it. <laughs> I appreciate it so much. I will take second. I am happy to be there and I thank you all for for engaging with it. Yeah, yeah well, it was excellent. We can't wait. I'm, I know that I'm very excited to see the. Do you have any idea when that will come out, the series? No, no, no. Uh, yeah, not soon. But oh. it's it things are moving along and, you know, there are, you know, uh, milestones that we've passed that are pretty significant. So hopefully soon. Well, we hear from authors like, oh, it's been optioned. And they're like, that doesn't mean anything. It could never yeah. get the production at all. So this sounds more promising than that. <laughs> so far, so good. Yeah. Well, we wish you continued success and we can't wait for your next book. Thanks, Aaron. And thanks to everyone who uh, is here and who read uh, my work. I've, you know, just this is like a writer's dream to hear from readers who have actually enjoyed it. So uh, thanks very much. Do you get a cameo in the uh, move in the uh, Netflix or it might not that be has been <laughs> that's been discussed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. There, we kind of have a running joke about like the worst you know, character, maybe I could try to play or yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna hope I, I would like to be in there. It would be fun. Yeah. Good question. All right. Yeah. Thank you everybody for coming and I hope you all have a good evening. Thanks again, Michael. Thanks everyone. Thanks Aaron.